this is a pre-recorded video of my talk for the Time Perspective Conference. First, thank you for organizing this conference during these difficult times, and thank you for the opportunity to participate. At the previous conference, my presentation included this image. It's a cartoon by Canadian artist John Atkinson. This image reminds me of my childhood experience of going out to see the night sky. I would look at the stars and have an overwhelming sensation of belonging to the universe. Now living in a big city, I can no longer see the stars because of light pollution. Because my accent is not always perfectly understandable over Zoom, I have invited my editor, Julia Druk, to present our text further. Thank you, Olga. Let's get started. Thank you, Julia. On this image, we see the juxtaposition of two worlds. One is the so-called natural world, the other is artificial. Over just a few decades, we have squeezed our whole world into a little magic rectangle that can satisfy our every desire with the click of a button. We have reduced our field of vision into these rectangles, which are getting ever smaller. Before the advent of screens, our field of vision was much larger. What we perceived, however, was dangerously unpredictable natural forces all around us. Science and technology were founded to counteract the messiness of nature Bit by bit, we, bu we built safe and predictable artificial realities. The screens that currently take up so much of our attention are the latest in a series of tools that we have created to separate us from the dangers of nature. One of the first such tools was fire, an essential ingredient for civilization. In Greek mythology, the Titan Prometheus defied the gods in stealing fire and giving it to humans, thus creating civilization. While the gods severely punished Prometheus for this gift, the fire that was considered so precious then is now easily found all around us. We are surrounded by artificial fire and light accessible at the merest flick of a switch. This is the culmination of a long held dream illustrated by futurists like Arthur Radenbaugh in the 1960s, which depicted artificial suns illuminating the cities of the future. And yet some odd people have now started to call this wondrous illumination light pollution. For some reason, they want to be able to see the night sky. Traditionally, we have associated light with positivity and darkness with negativity. How is it that light is now considered pollution? For millions of years, the night sky was one of the dominant features across all human terrain. It was one of our primary tools for orienting ourselves in space and time. Like our earthly environments, it has been deeply integrated into our bodies, our psychology, our culture, and even our language. The influence of the sky is exemplified in our desire to break from the earth and fly like birds, navigating by the stars as they have done long before us. Ancient mythology has many examples of this desire. One of the most famous is the story of Icarus who flew too close to the sun on wings made of feathers and wax. When the wax melted from the sun's heat, Icarus plummeted into the sea and drowned. The story of Icarus also shows that in order to reach the skies, we have needed to invent technological solutions to enable us to do so. Before we developed the airplane or the rocket, this technology only existed in the realm of stories and myths. These were myths not of what has, has happened, but of what will happen. We have invented a technological mythology of the future, a future when technology could solve our problems and satisfy our deepest desires. Let's flash forward to the 1960s and 1970s, when our longing to reach the sky culminated into a space race between two competing world powers, the United States and the former Soviet Union. They sought to establish new territorial claims, not only in space, but also in time, in the future. The Soviet Union was a society that from its creation was particularly infatuated with the future. The underlying moral imperative was to build paradise on earth a scientific, technological, and communist utopia. At the same time, the United States entered into the cultural era of rapid scientific discovery and national fascination with science fiction. Even scientists predicted that by the year 2000, 
humanity would be part of an intergalactic civilization. We would have world peace, be able to control the weather and prevent all human diseases. The frontier for this explosion of technological mythology was the night sky. In conquering space, everything seemed to be possible. While many utopian images from this era exist and will probably be familiar to you, it might be interesting to show here a rare authentic Soviet document titled The Principal Schematic of Galaxy Exploration, pulled from an exhibition of the Russian State Archive of Scientific and Technical Documentation. It shows the three stages of space exploration depending on the potential speed of a spaceship. The arrow pointing to the bottom left corner shows the possibility of exploring other solar systems, a reality which of course is yet to materialize. The current vanguard in space exploration has been taken up by private companies. SpaceX, headed by Elon Musk, is currently constructing a new constellation made of satellites that will power worldwide internet access. There are currently nearly 1,500 Starlink satellites already in orbit. Musk is hoping to send 42,000 more. This has prompted a mini space race with other private companies rushing to send their own satellites into orbit. This has been met with criticism from the astronomical community because of concerns over light pollution space junk and the fear that a large number of visible satellites could soon outnumber visible stars and impact scientific observations. And yet who can resist the promise of global ultra fast internet coverage? When we have reduced our field of vision to a tiny screen, it is of paramount importance that we make that screen as connected and as powerful as possible. Of course, there's a price to pay. The price has been the sky. While it has been both accessible and foundational to our understanding of our universe, now it is only reachable through travel agencies, which advertise special stargazing tours in remote locations. Living in big cities we have forgotten or have never known what the night sky really looks like. It is simply no longer a part of our existence. A widely circulated story about a blackout in the 1990s in Los Angeles claims that some residents called emergency numbers asking about a strange cloud in the sky when what they saw was the Milky Way. In the meanwhile, the bright planet Venus has often been mistaken for a UFO when it is visible in the night sky. So what can be done about this? There are many organizations taking up the mantle of saving the night sky. A notable one is the International Dark Sky Association, a global grassroots network with the aim of protecting the night from light pollution. Artists have also taken up the challenge. Patricia Olinuk, who is participating in this conference, is bringing attention to the subject with an artwork dedicated to dark skies, which she describes in her presentation. What more can be suggested by artists whose imaginations are not limited by pragmatics. We now know that entire countries could stop traffic, businesses, and other services for holy days, carnivals, and pandemic precautions. Could these same countries and their cities dedicate just one night a year, or even 10 minutes a year, to the night sky? We wouldn't even have to turn off the lights entirely, just dim them, and look up from our magic screens to remind ourselves that we belong to something bigger, something vast and infinite. Thank you. Thank you.